Welcome to Podcast on the Brink, your weekly dose of Indiana basketball news and discussion, brought to you by the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. I'm your host, Jared Morris. Join me live at assemblycall.com every Thursday night and immediately following every IU game for our live IU postgame show. And visit insidethehall.com for complete coverage of IU basketball and to join the discussion in the Inside the Hall premium forum. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Podcast on the Brink. And earlier this year, a couple of times we had uh, who I like to call one of the, the pod fathers for, for I, IU Sports, Galen Clavio. And now we have his partner on the Crimson Cast, Scott Caulfield, who's, uh, you know, grew up in Bloomington. I think he's got a pretty unique perspective on IU Sports. He's, as I mentioned, been podcasting about IU basketball, IU football, as long as anybody. First time we've had him on, but welcome to the show, Scott. Good to have you. Alex, it's great to be here, man. I, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, you know, Galen and I started Crimson Cast. It's funny. He becomes like the podfather of IU basketball. I became like uh, some of the cr- assembly call guys were joking. I'm like Devontae Green of podcasting. It's like, I really did not get, I got the short end of the stick when it came to uh, nicknames. But I'll take well, it. I'm giving you the title, honorary, honorary <laughs> there Godfather. There you go. I like so it. We were talking a little bit before I hit record here. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because you know you've you've been through kind of the Crean era, talking about all of that, and and you know year four for Crean entering that season, there was a ton of excitement about where the program was. You know they'd been through three really uh, objectively horrible seasons. Um, but there was excitement because Cody Zeller was there. There was the development of Victor Oladipo, which at that time, we, I don't think we knew where he was going to get to. But there was some excitement that Indiana could be a pretty big, big team, pretty good team that year. And they obviously had a really good season that year and, and things went on from there. We, we don't want to replay the whole story. But why I bring it up is Archie Miller now entering his fourth season in Bloomington. And I'm not really sure how to feel about expectations for this season because last year was a bit of a lost season in in terms of, you know, they didn't make the tournament because of COVID, obviously. So everyone kind of gets a free pass. As you notice, there wasn't a ton of coaching changes around the country last year just based on the circumstances. But, Scott, I'm curious for kind of your thoughts entering year four under Archie Miller. Where do you think Indiana is right now as a team? as a program and what do you think what do you need to see out of this season to feel like things are moving in a positive direction um that's a big it's a good question big question you know you, you did you bring up a point like last year was kind of a free pass you know we discussed it on a couple of our pods like you know did did we make the tournament last year I, I know there wasn't I'm not you know silly I know there wasn't a tournament I'm aware of what's going on but it's like you know what do you count last year as because we you know we, we beat Nebraska um probably we're going to be in the tournament, but we're really on the bubble. Like we might've been a, you know, a play in game team. Like I, I, I can assume we were going to make the tournament, but it's a very gray issue of like, we weren't securely and we definitely weren't a protected seed. We probably needed to win one more game. If we had gotten blown out in the next round, like maybe we don't make the tournament all, but there wasn't a tournament. So it's kind of, it is a weird, you know, non free, free pass. This year is also going to be odd because you don't have really – I mean, we still don't know what the full schedule is. You're not going to have a lot of non-conference games. This is like the anti Crean schedule, like no non-conference games. Like Crean would be going bonkers about this. I don't know what's going to happen at Georgia. He's going to be like, I'm I just not playing the SEC this year. Um, but, you know, it's, it's going to be an odd year. You know, as we were talking before, the thing that I want to get into as I look at, you know, what I look for in this year is to me it's like I look at the comps of coaches going into their fourth year. So you mentioned <clears throat> Crean. You know, that fourth year was the year we beat Kentucky. Um, I'll pull it up here. You know, that was, you know, it was a good year. That team went 27-9. and nine. It was ranked ninth in the country on Kempom. I still kind of stand by, you know, if they don't play Kentucky in the Sweet 16, that, that Indiana team probably would have gone to the Final Four. I think they were the second best team playing in March at that time. That team was loaded. The next year you roll into being the number one, you know, number one seed, and you're, and, and you're off and running. Um and I'm not here to relitigate the rest of the Crean era, but like that was year four, you're there. You, know, you look at some other comps, you know, I looked at like just a couple others. I'll pull up, you know, Tony Bennett in Virginia plays a similar style to what, you know, Archie has, you know, year one is two. And he took over a Virginia team that was 10 and 18 the year before. 
you know, by year four, 2013, they're 23 and 12. Um, they go to the Sweet 16. Um, they're ranked, you know, 25th in the country, but they're, they're kind of off and running. And by year 14, you know, 2014, they're fourth in the country. They're a number one seed. They don't really, you know, do as well in the tournament, but they're, they're off and running. They are who they're going to be. Two other comps I'll get to is you look at, you know, Villanova, Jay Wright, who, by the way, man, Alex, we're getting old. Like, I'm sorry to break it to you. Like, I'm like, oh, Jay Wright's, you know, been there a while. Like, I'm going back to search his first year. It's like 2002. It's like, that's 20 years ago. Um, but, you know, his first, his by his fourth year in 2005. Now, he's an interesting case because his first, his first year is, you know, first year he's 19 and 13. Second year is 15 and 16. Then he's 18 and 17. And then he's 24 and 8. They're a, you know, a five seed in the tournament, makes it a sweet 16. And then again, they're kind of off and running. Now they're a top 10 team perennially. Um, but the one that kind of irks me, the most, the comp that I really think we need to look at is Illinois. You got Brad Underwood. It's his fourth year as well, right here in our conference. And I would say that, you know, when he took over for John Gross, you know, the, the team that he took over was 15 and 19, 125th in the country. I, I wouldn't say Illinois was any great shakes. They're probably in worse shape than we were at. Within four years, he's got Illinois turned around. You know, now they're projected top three in the Big Ten, a top 10 team. They have some, you know, all American potentials. So I look at this and it's like, okay, like Illinois doesn't have a better recruit. They have the same recruiting base we do. They have a lower budget than we do. You, you know, what is going on? We've had five stars. We've had three Indiana Mr. Basketballs coming in. I'm, I'm not here to like advocate for or against Archie. I'm just like, year four kind of seems to be the break point of like, this is kind of where you are. Um, and to me, it's really hard to look at Illinois just across the state, across the state and to be like, why can't we be like, it, it just drives me nuts. I spent 20 years in the last 20 years as an IU fan. Be like, why can't I be X team? It's like, why can't we be Michigan State? Why can't we be more like Wisconsin? Now it's like, why can't we be like more Illinois? It's like uh, Illinois. Like, who are they? Why? Why are they some great shakes? So that that's the tough thing, Alex. Is like, I, I look at this, and to me, I feel like I have higher expectations because I'm like, all right, we should be in the top three in the Big Ten because that's kind of where we should be. If we're finishing seventh, it's like, is that going to be our lot in life? Because there's not a lot of examples of coaches in year five, six, and seven who've just blown it out compared to where they were in years, you know, three, four, and five. The other name I'll bring up, and I'm not sure if you looked at this as a comp, but even what Chris Holtman's done at Ohio State, right? He made the tournament his first two seasons. They weren't in great shape either. Uh, Otherwise, they wouldn't have run off Thad Mata, right? After Thad Mata had that program right. rolling for so long, he comes in, makes the tournament the first two years, probably makes it last year too uh, if there was a tournament. If you're going to say Archie would have made it, I think you say Holtman probably would have yeah. made it last year too, right? And so the thing about it is those three coaches were were hired in the same offseason, right? Archie, Brad Underwood, and uh, Chris Holtman. So right now, based on performance, I think you look at the three and you say, what they've accomplished, Archie might might be third on the list. And when you're spending the money that Indiana is, uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, that's kind of the result you want. You mentioned finishing. Well, the thing I don't want to I don't mean to interrupt, uh, but the thing with Holt, the thing with Holtman that I think is interesting is he kind of has like I'd call it like the Aaron Rodgers corollary, where like Aaron Rodgers won a title early and he's a great quarterback, but now like he has you know he has mistakes in the playoffs. And it's like, oh, but he's still a title. He's, a, you know, he's going to win a title. He's, a, he's Aaron Rodgers. Um, oh my gosh, sorry. I had a phone call come in. And it just totally messed up my Zoom. Sorry. Oh, good. You can still hear me, right? Yes, sir. Okay, we're good. Sorry. Um, you know, but so with Holtman, his first year, they're twenty five and nine. They're ranked in the top sixteen. They have a nice. They, they may win one game. They probably underperform in the tournament. But he kind of got that off his back, whereas Archie's kind of the reverse, where his second year, you have the Romeo Langford year. They go 19 and 16. They lose, like, what, you know, 11 of 12 games in the Big Ten. They finish 8 and 12 in the Big Ten. And that's something I've also been hitting as well over the last couple of years is, like, you really underperformed. So now just having years where you're at level, it's like you got to go above and beyond at some point. But I, I think that's where Holtman – has a little more going for him is like you start off hot. It's like you can kind of underperform after that. Whereas like you looked at like, you know, Peyton Manning until he won that title. It's like, well, Peyton Manning can't win in the playoffs. Like Manning's playoff record and, and Rogers record was about the same. It's just Rogers won one early. So we're never thinking of Rogers as like a choke job. Um, so I think that this is also hurting Archie is that her first couple of years, he has underperformed at least in my expectation of what I'd expect and what he has. I think it hurt him in a lot of ways getting Romeo, right? Because it raised the expectations yeah. and then he underperforms based on 
those expectations were they fair or not I, I, you know that's that's not for us to go back and, and consider but you do have to remember that that year they crushed Marquette at the beginning of the year they beat a pretty good Louisville team at home they had a good they had things kind of rolling they were ranked and then and then they get in the Big Ten and it just kind of all comes crashing down uh, you know yeah. I want to talk to you this year about the expectations for this season because I've, I've been ripped a little bit by my readers because I've been doing power rankings all off season. I have any, any and anywhere six, seventh, eighth, depending on the day, depending on how I'm feeling that day. But it, it's not a slight necessarily on Indiana. It's more of my opinion on the league this year is going to be very, you know, it's going to be very strong. You know, I think there's a, there's a good possibility there could be six or seven teams ranked uh, in any given week this year in the big 10 is a seventh place finish in the big 10, assuming Indiana is a top 25 team. You know, as 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 you know, as an Indiana fan, is that something you you feel uh, would be okay, or or is is seventh, you know, in year four, not really kind of what uh, they, things uh, where where things should be uh, going at this point? Yeah, I mean, the answer is no, until you put the caveat of if we're a top twenty five team, like, and and that is really the irony of the Big Ten is yeah, if we're a top twenty five team, it kind of colors things a little differently. I would still say no. Um, because we play in the Big Ten, like we, you know, we talk a lot of football on our podcast as well. And one of the things, like the the mortal sin of Indiana football, is you know we're in the Big Ten East, and it's like that stinks because it's four losses every year. But like the reality is, we're not like, but that is who we play. <laughs> like we're gonna have at some point, you got to be Michigan, you got to be Michigan State, and it's like in the end, you know, Indiana football recruiting has gotten better, but we haven't gotten better compared to other Big Ten teams. And so in the end, like we don't, we still play in the MAC. And I, the same thing goes for basketball. Um, you know, we're, we're getting better. And if we can get ranked, that's a better spot. But we're still playing in the Big Ten. At some point, finishing sixth or seventh in the Big Ten is not good enough, especially when you consider you're going to have a Brad Underwood and a Chris Holtman, two coaches who are the exact same skill level. Like, nobody is like, oh, Illinois is, you know, going to finish in the top, you know, seventh or eighth. Like, they're, they're a top three team. Everyone's looking at Ohio State as like a top five team. Um, and again, I go back to, it's like, it's not like, you know, Izzo's got a long track record behind him. Like you have guys with the exact same off season and, and we hired one who's like, I, I don't know. I, I, like you said, I grew up in Bloomington. I, you know, came of age under the kind of the end of the night era, but I kind of believe in, you know, Indiana basketball exceptionalism. Like I have a buddy who's a Michigan grad and he kind of has the, the crazy Michigan football exceptionalism. We both kind of joke. It's like, like, I expect us to be a, a top-tier Big Ten team. I expect us to be competing for national championships and Sweet 16s and Final Fours. Um, we haven't been, so it's not fair to just you know, say, well, I expect that immediately this year. But I also I also don't think it's bad as an IU fan to be like, that's what we should all be striving for. You know, I, I've been slammed for kind of making this distinction, but it's like I've been a season ticket holder for 15 years now. My dad has been a season ticket holder for 35 years, and it's like we pay one of the highest prices in the Big Ten. Like what I pay the varsity club, I, I like – I'm okay doing it, but it's like I, I my buddy also is a, goes a butler. Like I could own butler for what I pay the varsity club in fees. It's like there does come a point where – you know, we look at this and it's like, all right, well, you know, it's going to take two years to rebuild here and a couple years in Korean. It's like, I also think Archie is just dealing with the, there's a bill to be paid of kind of having 20 years of like, just, you know, that year doesn't count. This year doesn't count. It's like, well, they still count. Like I'm still 42. Like I still buy tickets. I still am just missing years. where like, we're not in the tournament. I don't get to put us in our bracket. I'm kind of getting off track here. I apologize. But you know, so I, I think that to go back to your original question, I think seventh in the big 10 just isn't, that's not good enough for, for any IU team at any point. Even if everyone else in the Big Ten above that is ranked, it's like we, we need to be better than that. You know, I have exceptionalism that Indiana should be a top five team in the Big Ten, barring, you know, like what happened after Samson got fired. Like those were extenu extenuating circumstances. After that, you know, that was my trouble. I don't want to reliterate, re relitigate Crean. But that was my issue with Creed is like there was just too much up and down. Like it was great when we were ranked one. It stink when we were like eighth. Back to my you know points. Like why can't be we, we be Wisconsin? Like they're always in the top three or four. And you look at Michigan State, they have massive turnover every year. Guys going to the NBA, like they lose five stars, and it's like they're still able to stay in the top three or four of the Big Ten. So a long answer to your question is like I, I don't think seventh is good enough. But there's also the caveat that, like, I know the Big Ten is kind of loaded, but at some point we got to be one of those loaded teams. Like, we just we have to be. We can't stop being scared of everybody in our conference. I think the good news for IU fans that are listening to this and, and maybe thinking Scott's saying doom and gloom. I think there are some <laughs> things that we can 
look at going into the season as reasons for optimism and for reasons to say Indiana may be better than seventh. They may be better. They may be a top four or five team. I think number one on that list is Trace Jackson Davis. I think the addition of Christian Lander is a huge deal because if you watched Indiana last season, outside of Rob Finnessy at times and, and maybe on occasion Al Durham, they really had no ball handlers that could create plays, get into the lane, make, you know, you know, manufacture easy baskets. And I think from day one, Christian Lander, he's going to be a freshman. Yes, he's moving up a year. Yes, there's going to be adjustment periods. Yes, there's going to be days where he looks like a freshman. But he also has elite speed and athleticism, and I think that's something that Indiana has been missing. Do you agree that overall this roster, you know, from top to bottom, um, you kind of look at every position, is as well stocked as it has been under Archie Miller? And, and do you do you agree with me that there are reasons to believe that this team could uh, outperform, you know, a, a prediction of sixth or seventh? Yeah, I do. And honestly, I know it's been kind of doom and gloomy. I just, I have high expectations. I think this is going to be a good year for us. I, I am hoping and kind of optimistic that we're going to have that kind of fourth year in Crean where it's like we really beat expectations. And by the way, those are the most fun years. Like when you're coming in to be seventh and then you finish fourth, it's like, that's a great year because you're just doing things you don't expect. I, I agree with you. I mean, to me, when I look at this roster, the big key is this is the first time under Archie that he's bringing in a great freshman who doesn't have to shoulder the entire load like you know Archie's first year was his first year that's fine second year you know Romeo's there Romeo Bates gets like hey man you got to run the offense last year it's like Trace Jackson Davis like hey you're a stud guess what the offense is going to run through you like they weren't able to be freshmen honestly in both of their cases they honestly weren't freshmen like they didn't have one of like they never had one of I guess Romeo had times but for the most part, like, they never had that three or four week stretch where it's like, man, they're just they're not doing well, which is very normal for a freshman. And that's kind of the basketball I think you and I are accustomed to where it's like, hey, A.J. Guyton's great, but he's going to have three weeks where he just doesn't play well. And it's like, that's fine because we don't need him to score 18 points a game. This is the first time where you look at you know Christian Lander. I think he has all the skills you mentioned. I don't keep up with recruiting as much. I obviously know who he is and what he can do. But it's like he doesn't need to come in and be, you know, the focal point of the offense. What he does is going to be great. But if he has a night or a couple of weeks where it's like he's a freshman, he's hitting the wall, just not doing it that well, you still have Rob Fennessy, who's a junior. You still have Trace Jackson Davis, who's a sophomore. You have guys who have been there who can run this. And so you kind of have that built infrastructure there. And so I think to me that's the biggest key coming into this year is that you have some great freshmen who kind of are allowed to be freshmen. I mean, you had a little bit with Franklin last year. You saw that. Like, he kind of had ebbs and flows, and that's fine. Like that is what freshmen are supposed to do. Um, I, I think it's huge, and I, I think, you know, I think Jackson Davis is key to being that guy. And the point I'm going to flip it to you. The question that I have for you, as you look at this team is, you know, this is a question that I think kind of needs to be answered at some point. It's like, what is this? What is the, the Indiana basketball identity under Archie Miller? Cause when you look at some of the stats that they're kind of just, I don't want to say pedestrian, but we're kind of, basic across the map like last year and you know you think all right we had trace jackson davis we push it inside a lot because we don't shoot threes well it's like all right we're you know we were like you know uh in three two point shooting percentage is like 11th in the big 10 so we're right you know kind of below average like three point shooting percentage i know we're not good we're seventh in the big 10 it's kind of big 10 only stats like free throws we're not good you know tempo we're kind of mid average like we're kind of mid across the board the only thing i'd say we're elite at is our defense is getting better but i'll ask you like what would you say is, you know, what's the identity of an Archie Miller team coming into this year? Well, I think if you're going to win with defense and you're not going to have elite shooting, um, you better take care of the ball. And and I haven't seen that uh, with enough consistency. And that's something I think that really needs to improve because, you know, we keep saying we don't want to relitigate the Crean era. But if you go back and you watch the Crean teams, what the things that annoyed people the most – where they could outscore teams, they could beat any team on a given night if they made threes, right? But when the shots weren't falling, they had nothing to fall back on. And a big reason of that was because the defense wasn't very good and they couldn't take care of the ball consistently. So I think for the style of play that Archie wants to play, I, you know, people talk about, well, maybe they're going to run up and down more. You know, you look at his team's it's not. It, it's going to be a controlled style. That he. That's how he's playing. He, he's not. He's going to kind of be. I think middle of the pack in terms of tempo, but I think really they're they're going to have to emphasize 
getting the ball inside as much as possible until they prove that they can knock down three-point shots with any consistency. I don't think you're going to see a ton of volume of three-point shooting ever uh, under Archie unless he just recruits some stud shooters and, and kind of lets them go. We're not going to see uh, you know, games where they're making 17, 18 three-pointers like we did under Crean. They're just not going to have the possessions in a game to do that. But I really think um, – and, and I do, and I agree with a lot of people who who believe that this is a sustain more sustainable way to win in the Big Ten, and it's what Wisconsin does. They defend, they take care of the ball, they limit possessions, and they and they just kind of grind out wins. Unless you have five star studs like Kentucky and Duke, and you just roll the ball out there and say we're just going to beat you with our talent, you have to have a scheme that can. Um, you know, win consistently, and and I and I think with the pack line defense, and I and I think controlling the ball as much as possible, limiting possessions and playing good defense. I think that gives Indiana its best chance to win. And, and, and I want to see that with more consistency. Uh, and so far we just, you know, the defense has gotten better, but I, I don't think they take care of the ball well enough. And, and, and the shooting to me, I, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this. You know, a lot of people have asked me, do they not emphasize it? Do they not practice it enough? I don't know how much it's on the coaches as, as much as it is on guys getting in the gym and doing the extra work. You only get a certain amount of time to to work with your team every week. I mean, there's a lot that has to be covered. I think it's two things. One, you got to recruit better shooters, right? I mean, you don't, you don't, there's, there's, of course there's Victor Oladipo's that come to campus and, and work and, and, you know, become the number two pick in the draft, but that's, that's the exception. That's not the rule. You've got to recruit guys who, when they get on campus can shoot. I think he did that a little bit better with this class, but I think it needs to be emphasized more. And I think it's on the guys to work. I don't necessarily think that it's some shot doctor. A lot of people like to bring up Tim Buckley. We need the shot doctor back, things like that. I I just don't think it's, it's, it's all that complicated. I think it's guys working on it more, emphasizing it more. And I think it's hard to win when you can't make perimeter shots, right? Last year, they had a lot of lineups where you had Justin Smith, Trace Jackson Davis, and Joey Brunk. Now, you tell me, how how are you going to score easily inside 15 feet when you have three guys clogging up the paint? I just don't see it. Yeah, no, it's fine. I've been going to games with my dad since – or I started going to games with my dad in 86. And one of the things he always taught – like, free throw shooting drives him bonkers – and he's still around. He's 90. He still lives in Bloomington. He doesn't go to games anymore. But I'll talk to him all the time, and he'll be like, why don't they practice free throw shooting more? And I'm like, Dad, I think they do. Like, I like I know we all think we know more than coaches. We don't. Um, but it's like, I really doubt Archie's like, oh, yeah. I, oh, you know, we forget to do the free throws at the end of the practice this entire year. Like, that's why. Like, I, I firmly believe they practice on this stuff. I'm with you. I think part of it is just, you know, guys come and the – you know, like Demise Anderson was a good shooter in high school. And he, I don't think he just didn't like, he, he can still shoot. I just think he wasn't getting the kind of open opportunities he had in high school. The game just changes in college. And some guys are able to adapt. Some guys can shoot better when they have pressure and some guys don't. And I, I think, and I also think, you know, the thing under Archie that you, you kind of have to caveat it. And we've talked about it a lot on like our pod. And I know you guys have too. It's just like he's had probably some of the worst injury luck in a three-year run you could have. You know, you mentioned Romeo Langford, but he comes in, he basically got a broken thumb the entire season. Like, his shooting was off because he was hurt. He probably shouldn't have played the entire year based on, you know, his injury. You have, you know, Jerome Hunter is the second highest recruit in that class, just doesn't play for a year. Um, you know, Rob Finn- Finnessy, Finnessy. Your, yeah. Your point guard basically hasn't had a full, you know, two years he's been injured. You know, those are massive in that that's huge pieces you're taking off. Um, and, and so I think that's affected some of this too, is that, you know, you can, let's say Finnessy is a hundred percent healthy and Romeo Lankford is a hundred percent healthy. It's like, okay. I, and Jerome Hel- Hunter was healthy. It's like, all right, I can deal as Archie as a coach. I can deal with Demisi not being the shooter I thought he was going to be because I got these three other pieces. But it's like you throw in three major injuries, two of you know two to perimeter shooters and one to Jerome Hunter, who's one of our better kind of you know uh, stretch guys, and you throw in that Demisi didn't turn out to be the shooter you wanted. It's like that's that's a bad hand he was dealt with injuries and kind of a a missed recruit. You know that's that's tough. But yeah, to your point, I don't know the answer. It kind of just seems to be you've got to get the guys in who want to work on that, and then you also need to. 
to your point, you got to have some schemes where you can get guys better looks and get guys look get get players looks that's better for the way that the, the way that they need to get it while they're playing. I think you saw that a lot of times we were forcing some shots last year and guys were taking shots that just weren't comfortable with whether it was like they needed the ball in transition, they needed the ball coming off a screen, they were having to do set shots. Like y- you need to get an offense a little more smooth. Where I felt like a lot of times last year under the Archie year, this has unfortunately been the way it's gone. Is like a lot of times we set it back up and it's like we're just trying to set up this one play to make it work and we don't quite get it and then guys are kind of off off their kilter and that seemed to only work well for Devontae Green who's like great I'll just jack it up whenever I want one other thing I'll say on just kind of the roster construction and what Archie inherited in, in fairness to him I will say that when he took the job there were three guys who were probably going to leave for the NBA which they all didn't end up leaving that kind of tied things up a little bit before that was all finalized you also had a situation where Grant Gilon was on the roster. I don't think they wanted him to stay, but it wasn't a situation where a new coach is going to come in and says, says get out of here, you're leaving, because you know, many times as a, as a new coach, you want to kind of secure what you have, right? There's been turmoil in the program. You want to keep guys around. You want to evaluate. Then, it, then later in the summer, of course, things part way, but he, they part ways with him. The other thing is he, he inherited Priller too, right? Maybe there was a recruit or two from Dayton, <clears throat> McKinley Wright, who's at Colorado now, that he would have liked to bring in, but he couldn't bring him in just based on the circumstances. So that's one thing I think people have to remember. But I do want to ask you, Justin Smith, okay? He's gone. And and my theory on this is a lot of people have, you know, will look at the stats and say, you know, it's not good that he left, that, you know, he's he's obviously valuable from a defensive perspective. My hypothesis is Indiana is going to be better as a result of him leaving because it opens up the potential for more three guard lineups for more lineups where you have Jerome Hunter at the three who can maybe shoot the ball outside of five feet. Do you think that the loss of Justin Smith will be a net positive for Indiana basketball? And are you excited for the potential to see lineups maybe with Finnessy Durham and Lander all on the floor together? Yeah, I I am. And I think it can be, you know, Smith was always not him personally, but that type of player is always one of the more frustrating players that I've had at, at IU where it's like this guy has so much athleticism and like he's just not taking the next step to progress. Again, it's not him. It's just there's always these players kind of like, you know, Andre Patterson when I was there. It's like this guy could just own it. And then you have these games where it's like he's scoring 45 against Duke in the NIT. You're like, all right, here we go. We're good. And then it's like now we're back to scoring 10 a game. It's like, Andre, what happened? Um, and I feel the same way with Justin Smith where it's like he'd have these moments where like he, the block against Michigan State, and you're like, all right, like that's one play. It's mighty. But you have these games where he locked in. It's like, all right, now we're good. And then he'd kind of just oscillate back and forth. And it's like, dude, just get lock it in, man. Like you could be so good. Um I think that he, you know, I I agree with you. I think it's going to open up the offense because, you know, you already have a great player in race Thompson, in my mind, who goes in and does, you know, some of the work that needs to be done, but isn't really an offensive threat. It was tough to play a lineup where you had race and Justin Smith in there because there were some games where Smith was kind of, I don't want to say an offensive liability, but just wasn't really doing much on offense. But like, but his his defense was great. He was good at you know getting rebounds. Like he provided a lot of good things, a lot of good things that Race did as well. But you couldn't really play them together. But then you didn't want to keep on something. It, it in an odd way for as well as as Archie has constructed the lineup. There's been these points where it's like he's really hamstrung with who he can play and when he can play him. Um, so I agree with everything you said. And, and back to the construction of the lineup, you are. A hundred percent right. Like, I don't think people fully understand the mess that Crean left Archie. We'll won't get deep into that, but just when you look at like, you know, scores and what he was what Archie wasn't allowed to do and what he couldn't get rid of people that he wanted to, like Archie was left with a mess. Um, the kind of the weird paradox with Archie is everything he everything else outside of wins i've been super impressed with like there, there's no problems coming out of the program you don't hear kind of all these crazy you know rumbling stories during the off season you have a couple transfers here and there that's fine but there's not this crazy like walk-ons you know throwing fits and transferring like under Cree, like every year it was like five people got transferred these guys were signing this guy it's like it was nuts there's stability everyone's kind of calm everybody that that i you know I've talked to like likes what they're seeing with the program. The recruiting has gotten better. We're getting recruits that make sense. It's not like we're just getting the last guy in the top 25 that we can throw an offer to it. We're getting Indiana Mr. Basketballs. We're getting local guys. We're getting the state. Like everything that Archie's doing is exactly what I want to see done. 
there's just not the, like, the frustrating part as a fan is like there's not the wins coming t- in result of that. And that's that's the hard thing is everything else is like, I love it. But it's like, I'd love to see us win 24 games and finish in the top five in the Big Ten. And, and in the end, like, I guess that those are the results that need to happen relatively soon. You mentioned the Big Ten, and that's kind of the last thing I want to talk about with you is the strength of the league at the top in particular. I'm looking at Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, Michigan State as potential, you know, top 10, top 15 teams. Do you, out of those teams, which do you like the best entering the season and why? And of any of those teams, is there any that you have, you kind of scratch your head and say, eh, I don't know that that's a top 10, top 15 team. Maybe one of those four that you don't feel as good about. Um, yeah, it's a good, I mean, for, so for me, and this is going to be an odd season. Like we just don't know how things are going to right. go. Um, obviously, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, we don't even no, have a no, schedule. We have no idea how many yeah. games they're playing. We don't know when they're playing. You know, it's, so it's, with all of that said, like you just have to say Michigan State is the class of the field. Like they they have the consistency, they have the best coach in the league, and Tom Izzo. Like, and they're a team that progressively gets better throughout the year, and and seems to deal with a lot of circumstances. They deal with injuries. You know, Cassius Winston went out for for parts the last you know the, the, his last senior year, and like they just kind of keep on rolling. The only thing that might hurt them is they're used to playing this like ridiculously. St- brutal early season schedule and they kind of get beat down. It's like they learn who they are by come March. The only thing you can say is maybe they don't know how to do that, but dude, I mean, he's bringing in these just ridiculously high level recruiting classes year in year out. Um, so, you know, they're to me, they, they have to be the class of the field. You just have to kind of give them an institutional pass. And like, and especially if everything's going to be chaotic, there's going to be a lot of changes. I would put my stock in the program. that has been basically the class of the big 10 for 25 years. Um, you know, the, the only one on the flip side of that, that I would say is maybe like, you know, you look at Maryland, you know, are they really up there? Um, I don't know. They, they lost some, you know, they, they kind of stumbled at the end of the season last year. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it's tough. It's going to be a brutal big 10. It's going to be a really good big 10. And this is really going to be, I'm really curious to see what they look at from a selection committee point of view. You're going to have to change it up because, I mean, I, I know I'm kind of going against everything I said that we got to we got to finish top of the Big Ten, but you know, this is really almost kind of a throwaway year. You, you have to put an asterisk by this because if we play basically a nothing but a Big Ten schedule, you could come out with a sub 500 record, but still possibly be a top 25 team. Um, you know, so there's a situation you could finish like ninth or tenth in the Big Ten, but still like have a compelling case to make the tournament, even though you're sitting at like ten. 10 and 15. I, I don't know how many games they're going to play. So it, it's going to be a bizarre year. And I will also say the thing that, you know, circling back to IU just real quick, the thing that I think hurts IU the most with this setup is you just had a bump with assembly hall. They, they've just, this team plays better at home. This is a very tough venue to play at. Um, and you lose that. Like you just, you, you just lose that. Now on the flip side, maybe we can play better in Cole. Maybe we can play better in Michigan state. We can play some places that historically we've had trouble with, but you know, it is tough to kind of look at this and be like, all right, normally we could like hold serve at home. I, I don't know if assembly hall still has that mystique if it's just sitting empty. Yeah. I've been thinking about a lot of what you just said a lot lately because you know, we're sitting here, uh, it's it's September 30th uh, that we're recording this. is going to be uh, released on October 1st, so we're a little less than two weeks away from the start of practice. We don't have a schedule. We don't, you know, we think that there's going to be 20 Big Ten games, uh, and we think that there's going to be up to seven non-conference games. I'm looking at Indiana, and I'm assuming they're still going to play in Maui. Um, obviously, in North South, Carolina. The, the North Carolina Maui yeah. Invitational. <laughs> Which funny how that got moved to near North Carolina. They're in the field yeah. instead of Indianapolis, right? It could have been uh, a little bit closer for Indiana if they would have done Indianapolis. But but that's a whole other conversation. But you know, three games in Maui. Um, I think there's still an appetite for the ACC Big Ten Challenge because ESPN will want that inventory, and I think that there's probably going to be. Um, a push from the Big Ten and the you know ACC coaches to play that, and I and I think it's too you know a lot of th- one thing that a lot of people forget when it comes to these non conference games, 
the big leagues are probably going to want to play the other big schools from a testing perspective, right? Because you're not going to bring in yeah. schools from the big South or, you know, some other conference that can maybe only test their players once a week. You know, the big 10 is going to have daily testing. I, I assume it's going to be the same thing in a lot of these other major conferences. So you, you throw in those four games, there's probably going to be the crossroads classic. I would think still, if, if there's a way to do that, because it's part of the contract. Uh, I don't think, at this point, it doesn't seem like Gavit is going to survive because it was such an early season event, and I don't know how that's going to you know play. But you could be looking at a schedule for Indiana where they're playing twenty five of their twenty seven against Power Five schools. So you could, you know, maybe go a little bit over five hundred and, and still be a really good team against that schedule. And and I agree with you on the you know losing some of the home court advantage of Assembly Hall could also play in Indiana's favor because. All we talk about every year is how difficult it is to go on the road and win in the Big Ten. But do you think it's going to be as hard to win at the rack with no fans? Do you think it's going to, you know, what if what if this is the year Indiana finally wins at the Cole Center? I was joking with a friend about that the other day because we were talking about the NBA finals. Is it as impressive to win the NBA finals in the bubble? And I said, I threw this back to him. I said, are you still going to be impressed if Indiana goes and wins at Wisconsin in the Cole Center with no fans? To me, I think it diminishes it a little bit because a lot of what makes the Big Ten special, they lead the country in attendance every year, is the fact that there's such support for these programs. The atmospheres, I've been to a lot of them. It's insane compared to other schools around the country. So I I think it could help Indiana in that regard, um, being able to go win some road games this year. Yeah, I mean, and, and who knows? I mean, obviously, who knows? I've said that we said that a million times. Like, there could be some version of fans by the time they get around to playing in, you know, November, December, January. Um, we just don't know. But it, it's interesting, as you mentioned, you know, going back to kind of the, the larger Big Ten, you know, th- this is a, a pivotal point, in my mind, a pivotal point for Archie Miller and just Indiana basketball as a whole. As, as you were kind of mentioning, you know, those top teams in the Big Ten, you know, you have – you know, Maryland, Michigan State, Ohio State, Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa are all teams that that are starting off the season ranked. You know, I, I kind of saw this coming a couple of years ago, and I feel like it's happening now that th- this is kind of one of those, you know, you had a period in the 80s, you had Knight and you had uh Katie, you had Lou Henson, oddly Lou Henson, the winningest coach in the 1980s in the Big Ten, like that's a great trivia question. When he sadly passed away, I saw that and I'm like, I would have gotten that so wrong um you had this kind of like the, the coach in the in the 80s and you kind of had this you know period in the 90s where it was kind of resurfacing and then it's like Izzo took that mantle and then just ran with it I do feel like we're at that point now you know Izzo I don't know has five or six years left I mean the Izzo run is definitely closer to the end than the beginning you know you mentioned Iowa it's like Fran McCaffrey has has a lot of years underneath him but then you look at some of those other you know and, and Terzon at Maryland has been around for a while but you have these other teams, you know, like like we mentioned, we talked about, you know, Ohio State and Illinois, um, you know, Guard and Wisconsin. Like you kind of have a younger breed of coaches coming up, and it does feel like right now is kind of that point where this could be the time where a couple teams could grab the mantle. Like we're going to be the team for the next twenty years, and and that is my fear is that if we don't if we don't get that done soon, you could get to a point where some of these, you know, like Michigan State kind of has an institutional wall built around them right now, where it's like, all right. You almost you can kind of go at Izzo, but you kind of almost have to wait for Izzo to leave and maybe hope that you know Dane Five or whoever they go with isn't as good. Um, but you know, you, you I would hate to see us be like, all right, we kind of putz around for three or four years now and let you know Illinois or Wisconsin or you know Ohio State turn into one of those programs where they can build those kind of fortress walls up with recruiting, and then it's like, all right, now we're continuing to play from a. A, 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 an area of weakness as opposed to an area of strength. So I look at this as a very pivotal couple of three, four years where it's like you, you got to get something done and you've got to kind of start planting your stake in the ground. Like, no, Indiana is going to be the team for the next 20 years that is going to be one of the leaders of the Big Ten. Absolutely. I agree with everything uh, you said there, Scott. I've always said that the first step, you know, people want to ask when Indiana is going to be, you know, <laughs> relative again. Are, are relevant again nationally the first step is being relevant in the big 10 right and they haven't been relevant consistently <laughs> yes. in the big 10 in 20 years right i mean that's that's just the reality of it they're relevant of course from a resources perspective they're relevant yeah. from a fan p- support they're relevant in in the number of podcasts out there talking about this <laughs> this this program that hasn't made the final four in what 18 years now but 
they haven't been relevant in terms of on court success consistently now in, in quite a while. And so yeah. I think that's the thing that we all want to get back to. Um, and, and, and I don't think people are asking for too much to have a program that just makes the tournament at least every year. Right. That's, I mean, that's to me uh, in this, uh, you know, in this in this atmosphere in college basketball right now, when you have a 68 team field to be in that field every year, I don't think it's too much to ask for when you have the resources of Indiana. But Scott, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. We'll have to do it again. Sorry it took uh, you know so long to get you on here as a first time guest, but um, yeah, it's not maybe 12 years again. Let's not do it in uh, in when we're yeah. 55. Well, you know, there, there's probably going to be plenty of opportunities this season, uh, depending <laughs> on how it goes to uh, to come on here. Maybe hopefully I'll. Maybe we can have you on after like a two or three game winning streak, and then uh, I'd, I'd love that. Yeah, and then and we things are flying high at that point. But but really appreciate you uh, taking the time to come on with us, and everybody. We'll be back uh, as of right now. We're sticking with the every other week schedule until the season gets underway. So see you in two weeks, everybody, uh, on another episode of Podcast on the Brink. Have a good rest of your week. Thank you for listening to this episode of Podcast on the Brink. We always appreciate you being here. Remember to join me and my co-hosts for more IU basketball talk at assemblycall.com and visit Alex over at insidethehall.com for complete coverage of Indiana basketball. If you want to support Podcast on the Brink, here is the single best way to do it. Tell anyone you know who loves IU hoops about us and suggest that they subscribe. Podcast on the Brink can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else podcasts are available. Tell your social media followers, email your friends, text your family members. For weekly discussion about IU basketball, they need to be subscribed to Podcast on the Brink. We'll talk to you next time. Go Hoosiers!